Welcome back. You're with India Global Week. I'm Ben Thompson. It's great to have you with us. And we're going to talk about a subject now that is one of the most pressing issues, but maybe it's been a little sidelined of late given the COVID crisis. We're talking about efforts around the world to tackle climate change and cut emissions. And it's fair to say maybe given the pressing health emergency, it's fallen from the list of priorities for many governments around the world. So what happens next? What should countries be uh, considering? What do they need to think about? And can the climate issue ever find its way to the back of the, uh, to the top of the agenda, back on that agenda as far as policy is concerned? So please to uh, discuss that, I'm pleased to welcome Barry Gardner, who is uh, from the UK government, former Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade. Barry Gardner, good afternoon to you. It's good to have you with us. Um, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce your panel and talk about what is or what certainly will be one of the most pressing issues for many going forward. Great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, look, welcome, everybody. I'm Barry Gardner. I'm thrilled to be your chair of, for this discussion about global leadership on climate change. You know, these people at Global India Week, they're really crazy. They have brought together five of the most influential voices on climate change on this planet, and they've given us just 42 minutes to sort out the greatest challenge that mankind and humanity has ever faced. So. Each of our panelists will introduce themselves. They'll make short opening remarks for three minutes. And I do mean three minutes. This glass is not a sneaky gin and tonic. <laughs> it is the sound you will hear if you've gone on for too long. So our theme is leadership. And of course, India has been influential voice in the climate negotiations, never more so perhaps than with its announcement in Paris five years ago of the International Solar Alliance, whose director is with us today. We all now know the phrase one sun, one world. And now India, I gather, is talking about adding that to be one sun, one world, one grid. So maybe we'll be talking about a, a global green grid and what that might look like. But first, I'm going to ask uh, Selwyn Hart from the United Nations to start us off. They will introduce themselves. Selwyn, over to you. Thank you so much, Barry. And um, thank you for the great um, introduction. I, I promise to stay within three minutes. I, I think it's more than appropriate that I've been asked to open the baton. Um, given that I come from a country that has produced three of the greatest batsmen, um, opening <laughs> batsmen ever. You know, I can say stuff like this to a cricketing crowd. Uh, Born in Greenwich, Desmond Haynes and Conrad Hunt are all from my country, Barbados. But but um, I, I, I cannot disagree more with the comment that was made um, to introduce this panel. I don't believe that climate change is at the bottom of the global agenda. Um, conversely, I believe that the COVID crisis has shown us that if we don't act together as an international community to address a pressing global challenge, um, it will severely, um, it, it will have a severe impact on lives and livelihoods. And, um, and it's absolutely important that we bring um, into greater focus the need for us to um, to address climate change as we respond to the COVID crisis. Trillions of dollars are being mobilized as we speak to address the fallout from the pandemic. Um, how these recovery plans, especially from the G20 countries, are designed will have a consequential impact on our ability to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And these goals are not simple numbers. The temperature limits and the goals of the Paris Agreement carry severe implications for lives and livelihoods. At present, 9 million persons um, die prematurely, early deaths, annually from air pollution as a result of carbon pollution. So we have a historic opportunity. And as Churchill said, um, uh, uh, we really need to, to um, use the opportunity um, um, of a crisis, and every crisis there is an opportunity. The UN Secretary General has outlined six climate principles, climate positive principles 
to guide countries as they design these green stimulus plans. He's asked on all countries to ensure that they invest in green jobs and sustainable sectors. He's also asked them that when they bail out polluting industries like the airline industry, the shipping industry, and industry in general, that they um, ensure that green streams are attached, that their conditionalities attached for the emission reduction cuts. He's also called on um, um, countries to phase out fossil fuel subsidies and to place a price on carbon. Billions of dollars are wasted every year on fossil fuel subsidies. And we've seen some really good progress with a country like Nigeria significantly reforming its fossil fuel subsidy regime. He's also asked for resilience to be placed at the heart of the global um, um, response. And we've seen that it's important for people and communities to be resilient, for us to make upfront investments in resilience so that we don't pay the cost down the road. And he's also called for us to recover better together. He's called for doubling down on international cooperation, solidarity and support. And this will be absolutely vital, absolutely vital if we are to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. So I will stop there. I, will, I, 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 I don't want to hear your glass and I'm the, sure that I'll come in later, but I think that, that that point is we have a historic opportunity as we recover from the COVID crisis to recover in a green, resilient and inclusive way. Thank you. So thank you so much. And, and it's great to have the Secretary, Secretary General's views coming full force through there. John, um, if you as, as the Special Envoy from, from the UK for COP26, that's the big climate conference coming up, uh, should have been this year, next year. Um, if you can take up those themes that uh, Selwyn's just given us um, and carry them forward about how we build back better and how COP26 is going to help us do that. Thank you, Barry. Um, three minutes is not even time for an England top order collapse in, in the battle <laughs> of the I will, I will do my best. Um, so we've seen huge international cooperation uh, in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, and in the long run, climate change is a much bigger challenge. So we need to take that international cooperation forward into the fight against climate change. Um, Barry's asked me to, to be optimistic today, and, and let me tell you why I am optimistic that we can succeed uh, in doing that. We have seen through COVID-19, we've all enjoyed, uh, whether it's in Delhi or in London, cleaner air uh, as a result of uh, the economic pause that we've, we've suffered as a result of, result of COVID-19. But I strongly believe it doesn't require a health crisis to reduce our emissions. We can decouple our growth from our emissions profile. The UK has been the fastest growing economy in the G7 uh, since 1990 uh, and we've reduced our emissions more than any other G7 member state. We've cut our emissions by 45 percent since 1990 and the going is getting easier. Uh, there used to be a trade-off between economic growth on the one hand and reducing your emissions on the other and you had to trade off a little growth to get your emissions down. Uh, but now that trade-off no longer exists and indeed arguably if you want to grow your economy now you have to green your economy. Um, and Bloomberg have got some fantastic figures on this that I encourage you to look at. Uh, they've showed how um, solar costs, solar energy costs have fallen by over 90% uh, in the last decade. And over the last decade, more renewables were installed than any other form of generation technology, uh, leading to huge cost reductions. So I go now, when I travel as an envoy, um, I say to colleagues in Northeast Asia, in, in Japan or Korea, you're paying nine or 12 cents a kilowatt hour for your coal energy. How will your energy intensive industries compete with industries in India who are buying solar uh, that's being generated at 3.5 cents a kilowatt hour? And these economies of scale we're enjoying in, in solar and other renewables are, are rapidly increasing. Um, there was more uh, solar installed in the world last year than in all time up to 2012. And this will get quicker. There are now 260 gigawatts uh, potential of production capacity for solar cells every year. And that means if you install 260 gigawatts uh, of solar cells next year, that's more solar panels than were installed in all time up to 2015. 
And these trends are going to accelerate with Wright's law, which says that the cost of production will fall in proportion to the scale of production. And we're seeing similar uh, economies with zero emission vehicles. And I, I genuinely believe that what's going to happen with renewables is, is much the same as we've seen with mobile telephony through the world. I did my PhD 25 years ago in Kenya. You had to wait eight years for a landline in Kenya, a landline telephone. Uh, and now there are more phones than people in Kenya. And if you'd have told people that in Kenya 25 years ago, they just wouldn't have believed you. Uh, and the market's already pricing this in. That's why Tesla is worth more than Toyota. And it's why Nikola, uh, a Californian truck maker, is worth more than Fiat Chrysler, despite never having made a truck. And India's got a huge role to play in this. And I'm really pleased that this week, India signed up with eight other countries, including the UK, uh, and calling for net zero emissions in industry by 2050. That's a fantastic uh, step. We're really uh, pleased that India was able to sign up to that. And we encourage India to set a net zero target uh, for the whole of the economy because targets are just as important as technology because targets uh, send the signals to investors about the direction of travel and, and help investors decide where to allocate their resources. So thanks for that, Barry. I hope that wasn't much longer than three minutes and I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, John. And, and look, there's so much there that we'll be picking up on in our discussion. Um, uh, I can see Jagjit straining at the leash on, on some of the things you were saying about solar, but I'm going to ask Sandrine to come in now and talk to us about the EU perspective, because the EU has been a, a major player in all of the climate negotiations, in the COPs as they're known. Um, and uh, of course, Sandrine has two perspectives. One is from the European Union, but also as the co-chair of the Club of Rome, which now must be almost 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, really set out this whole program of what sustainability would mean for the world. Sandrine, over to you. Thank you so much, Barry. And it's such a pleasure to, to be here and to be able to be part of this very important conference, because clearly, yes, India has an incredible role to play in the way in which we look at climate change. And also because we've seen very clearly through COVID, the, the, the impact that any type of pandemic can have on the world's most vulnerable and how we can actually prepare ourselves. And that leads me to two things. So first of all, even though I have an American accent, let's be very clear that I am French Belgian and hence can properly speak about what's happening in Europe, especially because I'm located here in Brussels, the um, European Union's capital. I want to talk about two things clearly very quickly. The first is that already, as you say, 50 years ago, we plotted out through the limits to growth that we would have a climate change impact. We knew exactly what that would represent and it took us 50 years to start to really understand the impacts. Already two years ago, the Club of Rome talked about the convergence of tipping points which is climate change with biodiversity loss, and now clearly through COVID with health. Now, why is this important? Because I think that if we don't start to make those links, that we will not have one singular health pandemic, nor will we have a singular climate shock, will we be able to actually start to solve some of the issues at hand? Because we have to talk about people and their livelihoods at the same time as talking about climate change and building resilience. So what we've tried to do and the work that we've done with the European Union and what I'm incredibly pleased to see coming out of the European Union is that the recovery package and the European Green Deal are both very much anchored in both social and green indicators, looking at the way in which we can build resilience, completely decoupling the economy from emissions, which exactly as was indicated, the UK has done a brilliant job, so has most of Europe. Europe has been on a pathway to decouple for quite some time and is doing brilliantly, except for a few countries. And those countries clearly are the ones that are having the hardest time because they are dependent on coal, Central and Eastern Europe, and shifting through a just transition to a renewables economy is more difficult for them than it is, for example, some of the other Southern or Western European countries. But why is this important from a European perspective? Because the European perspective is clearly that it needs to show leadership. It needs to show leadership through its green recovery program, which we are all working on very clearly now with President von der Leyen, to ensure that we can emerge from this COVID emergency and plan for the next health shocks at the same time as the next climate shocks. That clearly means that we need to look at all of the sectors, not just energy, but also move towards regenerative agriculture. And by the way, 
create the thousands of jobs, 500,000 jobs that can be created in regenerative agriculture alone if you shift from conventional agriculture. Or look at the energy sector, 10 times the amount of jobs in renewables versus actually coal. So it's very important to start to look at the jobs angle of the climate crisis linked to the health crisis and the preservation of our livelihoods. And I think, I know I'm almost there, that the European Union is very much through its package moving towards that direction. And the last point I will make is this is not Europe alone. It is speaking to the Indian. It is speaking to Modi. It's speaking to other interlocutors in China, et cetera, to see how we can actually move together towards our Paris Agreement goals, but also towards putting in place clear indicators to a new type of growth. Sandri, thank you so much because you brought into the discussion some really important aspects there. You, you talked about safeguarding our ecosystems and our biodiversity, linking up these challenges, talked about a just transition, and, and this is so fundamental to getting it right. Um, so I want to go straight over now to, to Jagjit um, from ISA uh, to, to, to really take on that perspective. Thank you, Barry. Um, thanks for inviting me to this fascinating panel. Uh, I'll make three quick points. Uh, first is uh, what's happening in geopolitics and how international organizations like ISA, how they can contribute. We are all aware of the increased strategic competition between United States, China, which is spilling over into other coalitions. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a high risk that that kind of a strategic competition may have some spillover impact on global climate diplomacy. Uh, what uh, what we've been arguing that issue-based coalitions and issue-based uh, initiatives like International Solar Alliance, which is a southern initiative led by uh, Prime Minister Modi and supported by France, and uh, the latest one, which is Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI, where UK is the co-chair, these kind of uh, issue-based global initiatives could uh, bring the whole pieces of the climate puzzle together and avoid getting trapped into the broader uh, strategic competition of two major emitters. That's point number one. Uh, the point number two is a story of India, which is just so incredible a story. Uh, I'm a, I'm, I must admit, you know, having worked outside in Europe and United States, I came back to join International Solar Alliance two years back just to be part of this incredible story. You know, India has announced a commitment of going 450 gigawatts by 2030, which is just amazing where we stand today, which is, you know, we, we would be touching 175 gigawatt in 2022, which brings an uh, investment opportunity of, you know, more than $600 billion. Uh, where more than 80% of the investments would come from private sector. You know, uh, people talk about COVID slowing down climate ambition in countries, but where I live in India, you know, we've seen uh, 14 gigawatts of solar projects being um, uh, announced, out of which 3.5 gigawatts were auctioned just last month. And uh, Selvin uh, knows this. Secretary General even yesterday acknowledged the good story coming out of India where COVID a pandemic withstanding, India is marching ahead uh, with its solar ambition. Just today, Honorable Prime Minister of India, you know, launched a 750 megawatt of solar projects in central province of Madhya Pradesh, Riva, which would not just power the state itself, but would, you know, uh, provide renewable electricity to metro in New Delhi capital. So we, we see these phenomenal uh, growth of solar in India and through International Solar Alliance, we are taking this story out, uh, sharing experiences to 85 member countries, where again, UK is representing Europe and other region and a very active member. Uh, I'll just close by issue on financing. Uh, see, uh, I, I've worked in uh, UNFCCC climate change negotiation, working with Salvin when he was a negotiator representing island countries. Uh, we don't see a big bang $100 billion climate finance deal coming in, but we need financing. So uh, our approach to this is look at innovative financial instruments, look at bilateral partnership. UK uh, placed $250 million in World Bank to power storage mission of India. 
uh, which has a huge leverage. We are thinking of uh, working with London Stock Exchange to issue solar bonds in some of our southern member countries. So one has to look at these kind of new financial instruments rather than looking for a north-south financial transfer. Let me stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jaggi. And look, it, it, you've raised two very important aspects of this. One was the diplomatic and the need for a diplomatic way through here and avoiding that competition between the two major emitters as you put it uh, and the other is the role that uh, market-based solutions are going to play in in financing the technological revolution that that, that has to take place um, so thank you so much for that i want now to ask melanie to come in and and perhaps bring a a slightly different perspective to bear. We, we've seen this from the point of view of, of countries, of the UN, of, of the European Union, um, but we need to look at this also as an issue for civil society. We need to understand how change comes not simply from the top down, but also actually from the bottom up, and how we galvanize that support in communities behind what needs to happen. So, Melanie, this is very much your, your experience and, and your knowledge base here. Please guide us through this. Uh, thank you very much. Barry, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joining everyone on this subject. Um, first of all, on the subject, I again, I have to join Selwyn in disagreeing with the assumption behind today, which is that climate has fallen off a cliff, because actually it hasn't. Um, you know, just because we don't have the protesters on the, on the streets, it doesn't mean that simply because the headlines have gone away that these issues are not at the top of the policy agenda. They are very much on the top of the policy agenda because what we're trying to address is the systemic crises that we're facing with the pandemic, uh, with the crisis of climate, with the crisis of nature, with the crisis of justice. And so this is forcing everybody within civil society, within institutions, within government, to think very differently about how to address these issues. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's bizarre that none of us have mentioned that the new normal is working from our homes. Our homes mm -hmm. have now become our offices. You know, we're all talking to each other across many different geographies, but we're reliant on, as in my case, really rubbish broadband in London, <laughs> you know? And, um, and we've adjusted quite rapidly to this new normal, but I think one of the key lessons from the pandemic, which by the way, is not over, we are still very much in the throes of the pandemic. We have had half a million people dead already worldwide. And just to put that in context, that is more than all of the people who have died due to floods and storms of the past 20 years. And as we know, the past 20 years have seen a doubling of extreme weather events and death and destruction as a result of that. So we're living in a very major and complex unfolding of, system, of a systemic crisis. And so how to address that, I think, first and foremost, is to address it as a very complex risk issue. And our institutions have not been gearing around de dealing with complex systemic risks very well. Um, one of the things that we have learned is that we can't manage climate risk as we didn't manage pandemic risk just by looking at, at it as a singular risk issue, just by the conventional hazard by hazard approach. So we have to develop a very new approach, a multi-hazard approach to dealing with risk and then building the resilience that Sandrine spoke of. This requires us to do a really important thing and that is to remember where we were five years ago and the international commitments that we took on in 2015, we signed up to four, four, four or five major international agreements beginning at the beginning of the year with the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. Now, most governments did unfortunately not take that seriously. They did not de de develop the national strategies for integrated risk management, which including how to deal with biological risks such as pandemics, how to deal with uh, disasters, man-made or otherwise, and how to deal with climatic risk. We're now seeing the results of that neglect. At the end of the year, of course, we adopted the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. So going forward, what we are hearing from community organizations, from civil society groups, it's let's remember the commitments that we made, 
the Sustainable Development Goals. And at the top of this year, 2020, when we are in the throes of finding new ways of addressing these, this recovery, a green recovery, an inclusive recovery, a social recovery, let's look at the Agenda 2030 and the recommendations that Selvin, I know, is is going to want to pick up on. Thank you. I want to avoid the crystal clink of your glass back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Look, this is this is fantastic because we really have brought in so much into this discussion. I just wish we had three hours now to 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 really tease it all out. Um, critically, here we're talking about bringing things together, and, and it was. Fantastic that you said that about five years ago in Sendai and the SDGs uh, and Paris. And of course, this year was supposed to be the big year for climate, mm. wasn't it? Mm. Climate and the environment, because we were going to have the major conference in Glasgow on climate and the major conference in Kunming on uh, biodiversity. And, and it's the way in which these come together that is so critical to really getting full, comprehensive, holistic engagement around sustainable issues. Um, so can we begin to talk maybe in the discussion, let's start off by talking about how, what building back better looks like. Who would like to kick us off with that? Sandrine, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, building back better doesn't look like propping up the old economy. And unfortunately, that's what we're looking at, right? So even if Europe, from a European perspective, and the European Commission is asking member states to not actually continue to invest in business as usual industries, hence not prop up the aviation sector or use its very precious money at this time to bail out fossil fuel companies or automotive manufacturers, but instead to ensure jobs, jobs transfer towards a decarbonized and healthier, greener economy. That is what building back better looks like, but that's not what's happening in practice. And even if we get statements from the IMF, or if we get statements from the big multilateral development banks that are saying we're going to tie, including the European Union, our funding, our state funding, our help to you towards conditions around what is green and what is social, we are seeing that countries are going ahead and going backwards rather than forwards. And this is really problematic. <laughs> John, maybe you want to, to, to take up that because much of, of the UK economy as well as many other developed economies are so focused now on propping up jobs, making sure that companies don't go to the wall, that they're not building in that conditionality that, that Sandrine has just spoken about. And if we're going to be able to have strong business, have a strong economy to do the things that we need, how are we going to balance the need for a just transition, the need for the transition that Sandrine talked about, um, and, and make sure that actually we have the economy that is fit for the future uh, and not just building back what we had before? Thanks, Brian. It's a really difficult question. And um, the point about just transition is, is well made um, because uh, these changes can be really disruptive. I mean, there are whole communities invested in, 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 in coal production, in oil production, in, 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 in the hydrocarbon sector more generally. And um, there aren't votes, you know, for, for the democracies like ourselves, like India, there aren't votes in shutting down um, major employing industries, particularly if you've got a, an election system that's based upon uh, constituencies, as you, as you will be oh. very familiar with. So you have to address that issue of just transition. And otherwise, I mean, I, I spoke a lot about technology and price reductions, but even if renewables were free, you wouldn't necessarily persuade everyone to make the transition to renewables unless you could resolve the social issues that are affected you know, by transition. Now, we transitioned away from the production of coal in the UK uh, in a sort of, in a very painful way during the 80s and 90s, but then it made the transition away from using coal in power production much easier because we divorced the two. But when those two are united as they are in many countries in Europe and in Southeast Asia, that's a difficult challenge. And we need to, if we lose sight of that, then we will not bring people with us However, 
we need to wear at the back of our minds that the longer we delay such a transition, the more brutal and sudden it can, it might become because um, the technology continues to evolve, the cost of renewables keep on falling, and uh, unless we take on the new technology, we simply won't be able to compete with the other countries who maybe have adopted that technology, and that's the the economic argument for pushing ahead with with climate action. Someone, I, I saw you stroking your your beard there. So, 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 yeah. So, so, um, I agree with everything that my colleagues have said, and and um, I think that the picture is a bit mixed. We've seen um, good signals coming from the European Union, um, from Korea, um, and um, and the UK, who've clearly indicated that they. Um, as part of their recovery from the COVID crisis, um, they will ensure that they they double down on investments um, in green infrastructure um, and in renewables and in many of the solutions that address many of the challenges associated with climate change. Um, I fully agree with John's comment that 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 we also need to ensure that um, that 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 the just transition is part of the Build Back um, Better policy menu. And the just transition is not propping up fossil fuel in this, uh, um, um, industries. It, it is addressing the needs of peoples and communities um, that are tied to these industries. And unfortunately, many countries are focusing, have been bailing out um, industries rather than on, rather than focusing on peoples and communities. We're also seeing um, um, countries attach climate disclosure conditionalities. Canada is a good example. And this has, a, 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 you know, this is an important um, um, tool in the policy, our policy and regulatory um, arsenal of governments that is significantly underutilized. And I know um, Mark Carney um, has mm. been working hard to ensure that that the TCFD um, recommendations are incorporated. And this is the time to do that. So in, no, in, I, in, yeah, this is the time the for us to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Good, good. Great. Look, I, absolutely. You're talking about how we get this uh, embedded in communities in a way that is sustainable, in a way that is long term. Um, Jagdeep, the role that solar is playing in India, I think we all think is quite immense. And obviously the leadership that, that you've shown with, with the ISA and the way in which other countries are coming in behind that is, is really positive. Talk us through what else is happening in India though. Talk us through what's happening in local communities. What about disaggregated grids? What about um, local solutions? And, and what's happening on the coal front in India? Uh, because India has been traditionally one of the, the very strong users of coal for power. Um, how is that shift taking place? What impact is it having on, on local communities? Sure. Um, so uh, just in terms of this uh, bailing out uh, and, you know, stabilizing the economic crisis, which has come out of this pandemic, we, we know that India has pumped in about $200 billion just to keep the liquidity glowing. But within that, not many people have realized that they put in about $10 billion to keep the distribution companies going. And that has uh, in particular helped all the private sector uh, producers, primarily from the renewable sector. Uh, the solar ones and uh, we, which had this huge uh, payment delay crisis coming on their head if the government would not have supported this distribution companies. So uh, in a way, uh, you're trying to keep your whole solar industry and renewables in general afloat while there is a huge payment and liquidity crisis hitting your economy. That's one. But on a, on a broader scale of things, what we see in India is now rooftop solar is going through the roof, literally. Now we, we see in the residential sector, there is a big revolution com, uh, coming where, where consumers would be producers. There is a new uh, regulatory environment being uh, discussed and soon would be implemented, which is prosumers regulation. You produce, you consume, and you give rest to the grid. 
And that would just revolutionize uh, this whole uh, solar industry, if you will. Solar panels would be commoditized. You will go to a shop and buy a solar module as if you're buying a TV or a printer. You will put it on your home and there you go. Similarly, the storage uh, revolution is coming along. That's one piece. The other big piece I wish to highlight here is this whole agriculture uh, sector where government of India has pushed in uh, solar water pumps of the order of millions of units. Essentially, uh, you know, uh, we know uh, agriculture, electricity being given free is a political issue all, all along. What they're trying to do is cut it in, in, in its bar, uh, net and, you know, just close the issue, give farmers solar panels, they produce their own electricity and dry water in a sustainable way and grow their crops. No free electricity coming in. That, you know, makes the distribution companies healthy, delinks it from the political issue it has been and makes environment healthy and air clean. So those are the big issues which are way below the radar, but then when they will show the impact, you will see the whole electricity production and consumption in India completely transformed. And in terms of the people who are listening to this discussion, the, the business leaders, the, the, the investors who are thinking about investing in, in India, what is the opportunity there for them in all of this? See, uh, independent power production uh, uh, regulations are fairly stable. We have seen both, you know, Canadian pension funds coming in and many Europeans, even Nordics uh, and Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds coming in, uh, investing through national infrastructure investment fund in various green assets, including solar. So that regulatory environment has been fairly stable with payment guarantees and all, with bit of a blip in some states. But overall, I think it's been stable. And uh, again, in this COVID crisis, government is making a concerted push that external investment is taken care in a way that uh, uh, regulatory environment remains stable and there are no default issues. The second big issue is on the balance sheet of the banks. You know, um, they have been under some stress because of non-performing assets. They're being cleaned. But there, uh, that's where I offered this opportunity of refinancing facilities where a couple of donor countries could come together, create refinancing uh, facilities, offload these assets from the balance sheet of the banks with the earmarks funding for new renewable energy projects. You could have asset-backed issuance of green bonds. We saw that a couple of years back where London Stock Exchange and in Indian Renewable uh, uh, Development Authority, they issued a couple of hundred million dollars of green bond, which was just put in into solar industry. So there are various combinations you could do to have investor sentiment go very high. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I, I, we've only got a couple of minutes. So I, I want to bring Melanie in um, just at the end. In fact, I'm going to forego my privilege as chair to, to, to try and sum up because I want to hear from Melanie on, on a couple of things that, that have been raised here. Um, I want to talk about the way in which we integrate um, the different agreements that the world has reached, how we deal with biodiversity, land use change, uh, uh, along with the climate agenda, uh, how we integrate those things, and how that plays out diplomatically in, in what we talked about earlier, um, the, the big conflict in the world at the moment, the, the trade disputes between the US and China, indeed hot disputes now on the border between China and India. How do these things play out into the way in which the global agreements must be brought together and drive us forward? Thanks very much, Barry. So I think the first thing to say is that governments must look to aligning their international commitments with their post with their post recovery plans. That's absolutely essential because we know that we have the blueprints, we have the international framework works they're there at the united nations governments have signed up to sendai to the to um, the sustainable development goals to the paris agreements and what we increasingly need to recognize is the un as a tremendous source um, and an arbitration platform to negotiate these uh, tensions between governments the un is 75 years um, old this year 
Um, I've worked within the UN and with the UN for the best part of the last 30 years. And I think that we're seeing the finest hour of the UN. For every single issue that we've discussed today, there is a one UN approach to it. The six recommendations that Selvin mentioned the, that um, the Secretary General has been pushing, these are ones that we have taken up across business, finance, civil society, institutions everywhere. There is consensus behind these. I think what we need to remember is that we have to reach an outcome at COP26 in Glasgow next year, which is seen as being decisive, as being ambitious, as being inclusive, and as being as just. I think that we have the frameworks to enable us to do that. We need governments to remind themselves of what their commitments are and to deliver along that track. We have, there was a mention of the green economy. Fi final thing, partnership for action for a green economy is a cross UN system wide initiative. Look into that as you're seeking to make your investment decisions. That was a fantastic summing up. Thank you so much to all the panelists here. Um, it's been a super discussion. We could have gone on for hours. I hope that those who've been watching and listening have been inspired by some of the things that you said and will take away the different strands. And instead of focusing down on each, we'll see them as needing to be brought together. Wish you all the very best for the rest of the conference. Thanks to our panel. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Barry and thank your panel, you thank much. you so much. Uh, really enlightening session there. Uh, and as Barry touched on, there's so much to fit in in such a short period of time. But we're grateful to all his panelists there for explaining some of the really big issues and quite how we will make progress as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, there are two uh, great uh, streams, two events coming up on the alternative streams. We're going to take a short break for maybe 45 minutes here on Stream A. But do check out the agenda at indiaglobalweek.com to find out what's happening on stream B and C. Uh, Edie and Priyanka are looking after those streams for you, so do have a click around. We'll be back at uh, 2.15 UK time uh, for my interview with General David Petraeus. We cover all sorts of issues from the security of the world, the response to the coronavirus crisis, and what happens next as far as global diplomacy is concerned. It's a really great interview, so join me for that at 2.15 here on the A stream, my interview with uh, David Petraeus. Stay tuned for that.